All right, if you'll open your Bibles to uh, 1 John chapter 3, we're going to be looking at verses 23 and 24. I said we were going to try to blow right on through this, and we seem like we're at a crawl this morning. Uh, but uh, there's some very, very important, important uh, words uh, that we're going to be looking at uh, this morning, spending some time on what I feel like is a very key word uh, that is, uh, I really feel like being misused in the uh, Christian religious uh, realm today. Uh, we're going to be looking at the word believe that you will see in the very first uh, verse, verse 23. For some reason, John uses this word believe here and eight more times before he closes out his book. Uh, in verse, in chapter, the last two verses of chapter 3, chapter 4, and chapter 5. He will use this word believe nine times. If you go back and look at the book of John, uh, you will find out I didn't sit down with my strong concordance and count them all last night, but I, I did some research on it, and you will get anywhere from 85 to 110 times that John uses the word believe. Now, when I say believe, you'll find believed, E-D. You'll find believeth, not believe, some of those words, some of those terminologies. But if John used that word that many times, don't you think we ought to get a grip on what that word really means? I think it is being so misused in the world today that it is sending multitudes of people to hell today. And the reason I believe that is because we have a different understanding of the word believe today than what the original Greek has of believe today. And it means the difference between spending eternity in heaven and spending eternity in hell. The reason I'm saying that today is very, very important that we understand that. Let me give you just a couple of examples before we read the scripture. I could say to you, I believe that I can be at your place by five o'clock. I have used the word believe, have I not? I could say to you that I believe they're telling me the truth. The benevolence committee can sit down and say, we've listened to all of the facts and I believe that they're going through a hard time in their life because I believe they're telling me the truth. I have used the word believe again, and we accept that. So when we're looking at the word believe, there is so many different ways to look at it. So when I look and say that we should believe on the name of his son, Jesus Christ, does that just mean that I believe that I can be there by five o'clock? Or I believe that they're telling me the truth that there was a man named Jesus Christ and he lived some 2,000 years ago and he died on the cross and I believe that he rose on the third day. So I'm a Christian and I believe that's what's going on in the world today. And that's not the truth. I, I can't pronounce the Greek, so I'm just going to spell it to you. And I'm only going to spell it once because I, I'm just going to tell you the Greek word. But it's P-I-S-T-E-U-S-O is the Greek word for believe. And it's used all through John's writings. It's used in other writings of Paul's writings and different ones. But we're talking about Paul, I mean John's writings. So I, I'm just emphasizing John's writings. So it's used like a hundred times. I'm just going to round off a hundred because they're saying he were from... 85 to 110 times in John's writing. So let's just say it's used a hundred different times. When we look at that word and we begin to dig into that word, what does believe really mean when John is using the word believe? When he's using the Greek word that I just read to you and he's talking about believe. Well, 
John is using the word believe and first of all, it means that we are convinced of something. And I'm convinced that there was a man named Jesus and I'm convinced that he lived some 2,000 years ago and I'm convinced that he died on the cross. Does that make me a Christian? No, that Greek word goes even deeper than that. I have to be convinced and I have to accept personally and acknowledge that he did something personally for me on that cross. And what I have to do is I have to be convinced that he died personally for me and instead of me having to die, he died for me on that cross instead of me dying. He paid the penalty as a substitutionary price on the cross of Calvary in order for me to be saved. I can't go to church enough to be right with God. I can't pay enough tithes into the church to be right with God. I can't be baptized enough to be right with God. The only way that I can be right with God is I believe and put my confidence in a man named Jesus and what he did on the cross is the only way that I can have a right relationship with God. Now that's the way John uses the word believe. But it even goes deeper than that. It means that there is no other way than Jesus and Jesus alone. Now you say, okay, you just said church attendance, baptism, tithing, all of that kind of stuff don't mean anything. If Jesus and you put your faith and your trust in Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone, when that man puts his spirit inside of you, these other things are going to fall in line with that. There will be fruits of Jesus Christ coming into your life by the power of the Holy Spirit and if you read Ephesians 2, 9 and 10 that says, By grace are you saved through faith. If you will continue reading, it says you become his workmanship. Uh, the next verse. And we're going to find that in the reading of God's word here in John's writing. But believe means more than an intellectual knowledge. And it means more than I just went down and I said, I believe. And I believe that Jesus was a man. And I believe that Jesus died. And I believe that he was there on the cross. And I believe that he shed his blood for me. If there wasn't a revolutionary change in your thinking. And you did not allow Jesus to become the Lord of your life. And he wasn't the commander in chief. And you did not start following his ways instead of your ways. You need to go back and check your salvation experience. Because Paul said that when Jesus Christ comes into your heart and your life, old things are going to pass away. And there's going to be some new things move in. I didn't say that. Paul said that. And it's taught throughout Scripture. If you can comfortably stand, stand in reverence to the reading of God's Word, 1 John chapter 3, verses 23 and 24. And this is his commandment, that we should believe on the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as he gave us commandment. Now he who keeps his commandments abides in him and he in him. And by this, we know that he abides in us by the spirit whom he has given us. Take a moment, ask the Holy Spirit prepare you for his word this morning. <laughs> Heavenly Father, as I bow in your presence, I come, Father, humble as I know how because you're the author of this book that I have opened before me 
And without the author of this book, empowering me by your Holy Spirit that is indwelled in me as your child, we might as well close the book and go home because I need your anointing. We've studied it together. We've read it together. We've prayed together. But I need an anointing for this moment and this time. That you would take a body of clay. Take a physical body that has a physical mind. And take my mind and my lips. And use it for your honor and your glory. To only use it as a mouthpiece for you. For my mind to be in total surrender under your authority to speak only what you would have me to speak. To be completely under the subjection of the Holy Spirit of God. And I pray that you would have me to say what you would have me to say. Nothing more or nothing less. And I pray for every heart, for every ear and every man that is sitting here today, that the Holy Spirit would move in every heart, ear, and mind that is here today. And if there's sin that is here today, I pray that you would take that sin, that you would grind it up as you did the golden calf that they made at the foot of the mountain, and that it would be ground into powder before this service is over. Holy Spirit, you have the power, the convicting power. That was what you were sent back for, to convict sin. And I pray that if there's someone that's lost today, I pray that today would be the day that they would feel the power of the convicting Holy Spirit drawing them to be your child, that they would surrender their heart and life to you and that it would not just be a consensual, historical knowledge, but they'd have a personal relationship before they leave this service with you. And I pray that the power of your Holy Spirit would sweep down among us today, move among us, and that you would be honored, that you would be glorified, that you would be lifted up when this service is ended, that Jesus would be lifted up. In his precious holy name I pray, amen. we go back to verse 23 I want to look at another key word that I think has lost its meaning in society today he said this is his commandment I went back and done a lot of study on the word commandment and I just want to read you and I don't think you'll find any shocking waves coming through what commandment really means. But it's an authoritative command or order. It is a rule that must be obeyed. Those of you that have been in the military, was there ever a time that when one of your authoritative officers told you to do something, that you looked at them and said, I don't think I feel like doing that today. Check with me tomorrow and see if I feel like doing it tomorrow and I'll give you an answer tomorrow and see if I want to read my Bible or I don't want to read my Bible or check with me tomorrow and see if I want to go to church or if I don't want to go to church or check with me tomorrow and see if I want to forgive my neighbor or check with me tomorrow and see if I want to love my neighbor or check with me tomorrow and let me, let me think about this. You know, I don't, I've never been in the military, so I have to go by the Andy Griffith and the Gomer Pyle going into the military. But, I mean, uh, I've talked to a, a lot of people that are in the military. They leave their wife. They leave their family. There's a reason. I know that uh, the Scripture uses being a good soldier and I think there's a reason that they use that in the scripture sometimes is because God wants us to leave everything and put everything behind us that he is first priority in our lives that we don't have any distractions 
uh, in our lives that we're saying you're first, you're foremost, our families. Uh, when you're in the military, you don't have your, your wife to go home to do the honeydews for. You're out there, you're all alone, you're under their directions, you're under their authority, and when they give a command, you carry out that command. That is what a commandment is. It's an authoritative command. And this is what this just said. And this is His command. Who is His? Is it the church's command? Is it the pastor's command? Is it the Southern Baptist command? Is it the Pentecostal command? What command is His right here? It is capitalized here in this passage of Scripture. The reason it's capitalized, it is God's command. What is God's command? That we should believe on the name of His Son, Jesus Christ. Yeah, there's a lot of people in the world today that are depending on Allah. There's a lot of people that are depending on a lot of different things in this world to get them to heaven. There's a lot of people that think they are good enough to get to heaven. There's a lot of people that think as long as I go to church and I do my good deeds, as long as I do a lot of uh, good deeds along the path, as long as I have been in church, as long as I've been, as long as I've done this and I've done that and I've, I've, I've done all of these good things, I'm okay Jesus said in His Word, God said in His Word through John's writing, this is God's command that you believe what is believed. It is trust. It is putting everything that you have on His Son, Jesus Christ, and Jesus Christ alone is the only way that you can have a right relationship with God. That's a command from God. That's His command and His command that will you will stand. The Bible says every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess. You may not do it down here. You may limp your life along. You may take your life along down here and you may not bow. You may go ahead and worship your idols down here. Nobody wants to think that they're worshiping idols down here. But how many things are coming between you and God here right now in this service today? Where is your mind? What are your thoughts? Where are you at? What is going on in your life? What goes on during the week that is coming between you and God? All of the things. And one day you're going to stand before Him and your knees are going to bow. Your, your, your tongues are going to confess that, yes, Jesus Christ, you are Lord. But it may be too late at that time. He said this is the commandment that we should believe on the name of His Son. Jesus Christ. Don't let that word should throw you off guard. Because I think a lot of times we think when we see the word should, it kind of gives us a, an out. Well, I can if I want to, but if I don't want to, I don't have to. Look at the word before this. This is a commandment. This is a commandment. You will believe on the Son, Jesus Christ. And look at the next one. Love one another. Wow. If he had just stopped right there where the comma is, we'd probably be okay with that, wouldn't we? I was reading back, and I don't even remember where I was reading it at, but... God was talking and he said that we do it every man's ways are right in his own eyes. If we would just stop there that we'd love one another, if, if I ask LD how, what do you think love one another is, he'd have one definition. If I ask Glenn what love one another is, he'd have a different definition. If I asked Dwayne, he'd have a different definition. We'd all, we could come up with our own definitions as to what love one another really means, wouldn't we? But see, John didn't stop here. And the reason John didn't stop there was because God was telling him, don't stop with that quill right here. Keep writing on that scroll and look what he ended up finishing out that sentence with. I want you to believe. 
I want you to be convinced. I want you to take this personally. This I'm, I'm still on the word believe here with the definition. I want you to put all your trust in my, my son Jesus Christ. I want you to get saved first. That's what he said. I want you to have a born again experience. That's what that word believe is all about. Get born again first. But second, I want you to love one another. But John, don't start writing. Don't stop writing right here. As he, God or Jesus, either one, fill it in here. As he gave us commandments. Ooh. I just want to read you that commandment here. Let's go back to chapter 3, verses 14 through 19, and let's just see what his commandment was. We know that we have passed from death to life. We know that we've been born again. How do we know that we've been born again? Because we go to church all the time. That's not what he said, because we love the brother. Now, wait a minute. There's just some of those people over there that I just can't stand. You better look at the Word of God. Well, there's some of them that I like a lot better than I, I like the others over there. You better look at the Word of God. I want to tell you something. We're playing church today. That's the reason we can't have revival today. It's because we're not meeting God's conditions. Is the reason God's not sending revival to the United States of America, Copper Springs, Guy, Arkansas, Conway, Arkansas, wherever. When we meet God's conditions, the then I will hear from heaven will happen, people. I believe it with all my heart. Uh, God's not a liar. He said, then will I hear from heaven when my people, which are called by my name, will humble themselves, seek my face, turn from their wicked way. Then will I hear from heaven. Then will happen when we meet those conditions. And I believe that with all of my heart. And the key word there is my people. He didn't say when the homosexual, the LBGTY, whatever it is, gets their act together. He said my people. My people. What did he just say here? We know that we've been born again because we love the brethren. He who does not love his brother abides in death. He's not saved. Verse 15. Whoever hates his brother is a murderer. Wow. Man, we don't have no use for murderers. Put them in jail. Send them to the lecture chair. They don't deserve to live, right? John just said, if you hate your brother, you're a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. Verse 16. By this, we know love. By what? Because he laid down his life for us. Who's he? That's Jesus. Yeah. By this, we know what love is. You don't know what love is? That's when a man named Jesus was sitting in the throne of grace, throne of heaven. Sitting up there, didn't know what pain was. Never knew what it was to be hungry. Never knew what it was to be thirsty. Never knew what it was to be rejected of man. Never knew anything about what this old sin-cursed world knew about. But he said to his father, If you need a sacrifice, I'm willing to leave heaven and go die for them sorry, no good sinners. Came through the Virgin Mary and came down here. Lived 33 years and went through the old rugged cross. And I could go through what he went through those few hours before he got to the rugged cross, but you know the story as well as I do. That's love. I believe he said over in John's writings, I believe it was in John, that no greater love has any man than to lay down his life for his friends. That's love. We ought to back up and kick ourselves in the rear end every morning when we say we love somebody. Do we really love them? Yeah, we love them until they say something or until we, they do something that we don't like. And then their, their history in our book. 
we don't have no use for them anymore. We also ought to lay down our lives for a brother. What could God do with this church if we lived that, just that one verse? Whew, what could God do? Hey, man, I know you said something. I know you did something. I know you, man, let's just keep booking on. I'm interested in all souls being saved. Let's just keep booking on. Let's just keep going on. We also ought to lay down our lives for the brother. Look at verse 17. But whosoever has this world's goods and sees his brother in need and shuts up his heart from him, how does the love of God abide in him? John's asking a question. Man, I see, I see you got, he even says it in one place. I don't remember what's in First John or, you know, be warm, be filled. That's Christian's way. Hey, I'll be praying for you. I got plenty of money in the bank. I got plenty of groceries in the cupboard. And I know you're starving to death, but I'll be praying for you. Is that not the Christian way of handling things? Instead of helping somebody out. Whoever has this world's good and sees his brother in need and shuts up his heart from him, how does the love of God abide in him? Verse 18. My little children, let us not love in word or in deed. Let's get down to the nitty gritty. Let's do a little deeds in it. Let's put a little action behind it. Let's get some truth behind it. Verse 19. I just want to read just the first part of verse 19. By this, we know that we are of the truth and we shall assure our hearts before him. By what? By this. When we start showing our love, when our love starts being expressed by the deeds that we do, and it's not picking and choosing who we do it with and how we do it and who we do it for. It's straight across the board. Don't matter who it is. That's Jesus' love. See, I'm so glad that it wasn't by how much money I've earned or how much hardship I've went through or how good looking I was. Jesus just said, you're human and I did it for you. I don't care who you are, Gary. I don't care where you fall in society down there. I did it for you. I did it for you. I laid it all down for you. And I want you to lay it down for everybody else. That's what he said. Is that not it in a nutshell? What would happen here at Copper Springs if we could live that out? That's what Jesus is asking for when he said, let's go back to verse 23. Love one another as he gave us commandment. There's that word commandment. Did he ask us? Hey, if you get up tomorrow morning and you feel like it, love one another. That's not what commandment means. Commandment is a authoritative command. His commandment. Colon. That means everything from there on is God's commandment. It's not what I got to say about it. Not what you think about it. It's what God had to say about it. And God said, get saved and then love one another as I gave you commandment to. Let's look at verse 24. Now he who keeps his commandments abides in he, him, and he in him. Wow. Did he say he who memorizes all the Bible, the one that's most Doctrinally sound. I wonder how many commandments he was talking about that he wanted us to keep. We get to pick and choose. Go back and study Saul and Samuel, I believe it was. 
for the bleeding of the sheep, where Samuel had to go over and confront Saul. Because Saul said, hey, we just kept the best and we was going to offer that up to you, God. Samuel said, but wait a minute. What did I tell you that God told you to do? God told you to destroy everything. And you didn't do that. So the lesson is partial obedience is complete disobedience. But we live in a society today that every man's ways are right in his own eyes. I'm doing okay. You just need to back off, preacher. I don't know where you're coming up with all this stuff at, but I'm doing okay. I hope you are. But you're going to stand before the man that laid out and says, keep my commandments. And if you want me abiding in you and you want my power in you, you'll keep my commandments. It's not about how you can talk your talk, but it's how you walk your walk. You know what's destroying the church today is the walk of the walk of the people that's in the churches today. We have the power. The power is in Jesus. The power is in the Holy Spirit. There's no reason that we can't walk the walk. There's really no reason. You say, you're, we're living in the 21st century. There's going to be a great falling away. God never said anywhere in his word that his people had to fall away. Nowhere. He who keeps his commandments abide in him and he in them. And by this, we know that he abides in us. There's a lot of discrepancy. He uses that word by this, the two words by this, so many times in this book. By this, by this, by this, by this. So what's he talking about? Is it by this, he who keeps his commandments abides in him and he in him? Or is it by this, that he abides in us by the spirit whom he has given us? Pick every which one you want to pick. Because it can be by this that you keep his commandments and he's going to abide in you and he's going to abide in us. There's a mutual there that he's going to abide in him and he in him. By this, when we keep his commandments, the spirit whom he has given us is going to abide in us. So choose whichever you want. But I want to finish with reading a passage of scripture that's one of the most, I don't know, eye-opening, heart-wrenching, thought-provoking passage of scriptures that I read multiple times over and over and over again, and I still don't have my brain wrapped around it. Matthew chapter 7. I'm going, to, I'm going to skip around because I don't want to read all of it. 7.13 said, Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, broad is the way that leads to destruction. I want you to notice the word, many. Many are going to go in by it. What's he talking about? He's talking about hell. There's going to be many people going to, in that. And that's Jesus. If you, I've got a red lettered Bible. Jesus said that. I didn't say that. There's going to be a lot of people I really believe. I believe that are going to be Christians, deacons, preachers, Sunday school teachers, song leaders. Many. Many that are going to hear the words that I'm going to read to you here in just a little bit. Jesus said, there's a narrow gate in verse 13 
Wide is the gate, broad is the way that leads to destruction, and there's many who go by it. Verse 14. Because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life. And what did he say here? There's few that's going to find it. That's Jesus. I'm just reading it straight from his word. Let's go down to verse 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he who does the will of my Father. See, this word believe that we started out with, there's a lot of people that says, I believe, I believe, I believe. They've never been born again. I can go out in my carport and holler honk, honk, honk all day long and I'll not turn in to be an automobile. And I can holler, I believe, I believe, I believe, but you better get a personal experience with Jesus Christ. And you're the only one that knows whether you've got that or whether you don't. You better make sure. Because there's not everyone who says, Lord, Lord. Not everyone that's a member of a church not every deacon, not every preacher. But he that does, because when you get a born again experience with Jesus Christ, you're going to do the will of the Father. Let's read verse 22. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? We've cast out demons in your name. We've done many wonderful works. Many wonders in your name. Verse 23. And then I, who's I? You're not going to be in front of the preacher. Preacher, I think this is okay, don't you? Preacher, I, I just don't see anything wrong with that. Everybody else is doing it. Get off your high horse. Then I, Jesus, will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me. You practice lawlessness. Verse 24. He goes immediately for saying, I never knew you. To the house built on the rock and the house built on the sand. And the very first words out of his mouth, whosoever hears these sayings of mine and does them. I will liken unto him to a wise man who built his house on a on rock. Are you a believer today? Randall, if you would get a song of invitation, please. <laughs>